angels in their glory never shone more. We pray for me, heaven's queen Mary, help us all who call on you, angelic hosts around you, singing praises of esteem, cherubim and seraphim, know that you are heaven's queen. Pray for me, pray for me, heaven's queen Mary, help us all. Queen Mary, help us all who call on you. You, O Virgin Mother of Christ, all creation holds you dear, seeing you as the most pure one after your dormant. Pray for me, pray for me, heaven's queen Mary, help us all who call on you. Pray for me, pray for me, heaven's queen Mary, help us all. Intercede for us before our Lord and God, your Son, robed in radiance, more than all the stars above, holy Virgin Queen, made so by God's love, robed in radiance, more than pure one you were enthroned as heaven's queen even angels bow to you and hold you in esteem robed in radiance more than all the stars above holy virgin queen so by God's love, robed in radiance, more than all the stars above, holy virgin queen, made so by God's love. Beautiful, holy queen, now rejoice, purest one. You retain purity and have born Christ your Son. Everyone who prays to you, bowing low before your throne, where you shine with radiance in your Jesus 
Christ wearing her splendid crown at the court of the Lord shines on us from her throne everyone who prays to you bowing low before your throne where you shine with radiance in your love so well known everyone who prays to you bowing low before your throne where you shine with radiance in your love so well known We hasten to your patronage, O maiden full of grace. We seek your help in every need, our queen and advocate, and keep us free from sinful deeds, O virgin most beloved. We ask you to forsake us not, give mercy from above, and keep us free from sinful deeds, O Virgin most beloved. We ask you to forsake us not, give mercy from above, O loving Mother, guard us now, who cry to you for aid. All those who place their hope in you remain so unafraid. And cover with your mantle blue your children who await salvation and redemption day our queen and advocate and cover with your mantle blue your children who await salvation and redemption day our queen and advocate
courts of the house of our God. Blessed is our God, always, now, and ever, and forever. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Eternal God, you gathered the separate into one and make the bond of love unbreakable. You blessed Isaac and Rebekah and marked them as heirs of your promise. Bless also these your servants of yours, Daniel and Margaret and guide them in good works of every kind. For you are a merciful man, befriending God. And we send that glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. By your hands to the Lord. To the Lord. Lord of God, you betrothed the church, a pure virgin, Call from among the nations, bless this betrothal. Join together these servants of yours and keep them in peace and concord. For all glory, honor, and worship are rightfully yours. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. The servant of God, Daniel, is betrothed to the handmaid of God. Margaret, in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The handmaid of God, Margaret, is betrothed to the servant of God, Daniel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of God, you accompany the servant of Patriarch Abraham when he was sent to Mesopotamia to choose a wife for his Lord Isaac. By means of a sign, the drawing of water from the well, you showed him that he should betroth Rebekah. Bless the betrothal of your servants, Daniel and Margaret, and make the world they have spoken a reality. Sustain them with the holy union with that comes from you, for you made male and female from the beginning, and you are the one who walk, matches a wife to her husband, so that she may be his helpmate and the human race may continue. And also, Lord our God, you had extended your faithfulness to your inheritance, and your own promise to your servants, our fathers, your chosen ones in every generation. Look kindly on your servant, Daniel, and your handmaid, Margaret, and make good their pledge and trust, concord, fidelity, and love. For you, Lord, have declared that pledges be given faithfully and fulfilled. By a ring, power was given to Joseph in Egypt. By a ring, Daniel was exalted in the land of Babylon. By a ring, Tamar's innocence was proven. By a ring, our heavenly Father showed compassion for his prodigal son, for he said, put a ring on his right hand, kill the fatted calf, and let us eat and celebrate. Your own right hand, Lord, armed Moses in the Red Sea, and just as your faithful word established the heavens and made the earth's foundations firm, so too will your mighty 
word and your uplifted arm bless the right hands of your servants therefore O master with a heavenly blessing bless now this putting on of rings and may your angel go before your servants all the days of the life for you are the one who bless and sanctify all things and we send up glory to you father son and holy spirit now and ever and forever Have you, Daniel, a good and honest desire and firm intention to take to yourself as wife this woman, Margaret, whom you see here before you? You have not promised yourself to another woman. Margaret, have you, Margaret, a good and honest desire and firm intention to take to yourself as a husband this man, Daniel, whom you see here before you. I have. You have not promised yourself to another man. I have not. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for peace from on high, for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For peace in the whole world, for the stability of the Holy Church, as of God, and for the union of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this Holy Church, and for all who enter it with faith, reverence, and fear of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our Holy Father Francis, Pope of Rome, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our most reverend Metropolitan William, for our God-loving Bishop Milan, for the venerable Presbyterate, the Diaconate in Christ, and all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our government and for all in the service of our country, let us pray to the Lord. For the servants of God, Daniel and Margaret, now being joined to each other in the communion of marriage and for their salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That these crowns may be blessed by the power and dwelling and energy of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have that this marriage may be blessed as was that in the Cain of Galilee, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That they may be given perfect love, peace, and mutual support, and shine as living examples of Christian life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord that there may be de that they may be delighted with the sight of sons and daughters, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That they may be blessed in the raising of their children and be given a blameless life, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. That every request helpful toward salvation may be granted to them and to us. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. 
that we be delivered from all affliction, wrath, and need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Protect us, save us, have mercy in us, and preserve us, O God, by thy grace. Lord have mercy. Memory, most holy, most pure, most blessed and glorious Lady, the Theotokos, son of a Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. To you, Lord. For to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is to all glory, honor, and worship now and ever and forever. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Most pure God, build of every created thing. Because of your man befriending love, you changed the rib of our forefather Adam into a woman. You blessed them and said, Be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. By uniting them, you made one flesh of the two. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one body. And what God has united, man must not separate. By opening Sarah's womb, you blessed your servant Abraham and made him the father of many nations. You gave Isaac to Rebekah and blessed her when she bore children. You joined Jacob to Rachel and drew the twelve patriarchs from this line. You made Joseph one with Asenath and gave them Ephraim and Manasseh as the fruit of childbirth. You accepted Zachary and Elizabeth and made their offspring the forerunner. You made their virgin Mary sprout into flesh from the root of Jesse and taking flesh from her. You were born for the salvation of the human race. You went to, you went to Canaan and Galilee with your unexpected gift and abundant goodness and blessed the marriage there in order to show your approval of lawful wedlock and its fruit, the birth of children. Most holy master, accept the prayer we your servants make because you went to Cana. Bless this marriage after coming here too with your now unseen presence and give these servants of yours, Daniel and Margaret, a peaceful life, length of days, chastity, love for one another, in a bond of peace, long live descendants, gratitude for their children, and an unfading crown of glory. Let them see their children's children, keep their bed unassailed, give to them of the dew of the heavens and above and of the fertility of the earth, fear their houses with grain, wine, and oil, yes, with every good thing, so that in turn, may share with those in need. At the same time, grant to those present here with them every request helpful towards salvation. For you are a God of mercy and compassion and man befriending love. And to you with the only beginningless Father, your most holy, good and life creating spirit, we send up glory now and ever and forever. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Holy God, you built out of dust and out of his rib, you built woman. You built man out of dust and out of his rib, you built woman. You joined her to him as a suitable helpmate because you in your majesty saw fit that the man should not be alone on the earth. And now a master, unite this servant of yours, Daniel, and this handmaid of yours, Margaret. For you're the one who match a wife to your husband, unite them in concord. Weave them into one flesh and give them the reward of fine children. For yours is the reign and yours are the kingdom and the power and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Turn to the middle of page 11. What God has united, a man must not separate. The servant of God, Daniel, is crowned for the handmaid of God, Margaret, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The handmaid of God, Margaret is crowned for the servants of God, Daniel, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. 
Lord our God, crown them with glory and honor. Let us be attentive. Peace be to all. Wisdom be attentive. Let us place crowns of precious stones upon their heads. They have asked life of you and you have given it to them. You have given them a blessing forever and have made them glad with the joy of your presence. You have placed crowns of precious stones upon their heads. They have asked life of you, and you have given it to them. Wisdom. A reading from the letter of St. Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians. Let us be attentive. Brethren, give thanks to God the Father always and for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Defer to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives should be submissive to their husbands as if to the Lord, because the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is head of his body, the church, as well as its Savior, as the church submits to Christ. So wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her to make her holy, purifying her in the bath of water by the power of the word to present to himself a glorious church, holy and immaculate, without stain or wrinkle or anything of that sort. Husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. Who loves his wife loves himself. Observe that no one ever hates his own flesh. No, he nourishes it and takes care of it as Christ cares for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cling to his wife, and the two shall be made into one. This is a great foreshadowing. I mean that it refers to Christ and the church. In any case, each one should love his wife as he loves himself. The wife for her part, showing respect for her husband. Peace be to reader, wisdom be attentive. Let us stand and listen to the Holy Gospel. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord. Glory to you. Let us be attentive. At that time, there was a wedding feast at Canaan, Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had likewise been invited to the celebration. At a certain point, the wine ran out, and Jesus' mother told him, They have no more wine. Jesus replied, Woman, how does this concern of yours involve me? My hour has not yet come. His mother instructed those waiting on table, 
do whatever he tells you. As prescribed for Jewish ceremonial washings, there were at hand six stone water jars, each one holding 15 to 25 gallons. Fill those jars with water, Jesus ordered, at which they filled them to the brim. Now, he said, draw some out and take it to the waiter in charge. They did as he instructed them. The waiter in charge tasted the water, made wine without knowing where it had come from. Only the waiters knew since they had drawn the water. Then the waiter in charge called the groom over and marked to him, People usually serve the choice wine first, then when the guests have been drinking a while, a lesser vintage. What you have done is keep the choice wine until now. Jesus performed this first of his signs in Cana and Galilee. Thus did he reveal his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Let us all say with our whole soul and with our whole mind, let us say, Lord have mercy. O Lord Almighty God of our fathers, we pray you here and have mercy. Lord have mercy. Have mercy in us, O God, according to your great mercy, we pray you here and have mercy. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Let us also pray for the servants of God, Daniel and Margaret, now being joined to one another for their health and salvation. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Again, we pray for the people here present to await your great and abundant mercy. For those who show us mercy, and for all Christians of the true faith. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. We pray, merciful, loving God, we give glory to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Lord of God, in your plan of salvation, you saw fit to prove marriage honorable. By going to Canaan Galilee, you have consented to join together your servants, Daniel and Margaret. Now keep them in peace and concord. Prove their marriage honorable. Preserve their bed undefiled. Let their life together remain without blemish and find them worthy of reaching a fruitful old age. As with your pure heart, they do whatever you command. For you are God, a merciful and loving God, and to you with your beginninglessness, Father, and your holy good and life-creating spirit, now and ever and forever. Protect us, save us, have mercy in us, and preserve us, O God, by your grace. Lord, have mercy. Let this whole day be perfect, holy, peaceful, and without sin. Let us beseech the Lord. Pray this, o Lord. For an angel of peace, a faithful guide and guardian of our souls and bodies. Let us beseech the Lord. Pray this, o Lord. For the pardon and remission of our sins and offenses, let us beseech the Lord. For what is good and beneficial to our souls and for peace in the world, let us beseech the Lord. That we may spend the rest of our life in peace and repentance, let us beseech the Lord. For a Christian, painless, unashamed, peaceful end of our life, and for a good account before the fearsome judgment seat of Christ, let us beseech the Lord. Asking for unity in the faith and for communion in the Holy Spirit, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. And make us worthy, O Master, that we may with confidence without condemnation dare call you Father, God of heaven, and say,
Son is the kingdom and the power and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. Bow your heads to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. O God, with your strength, you created everything. You placed the universe upon a firm foundation and beautified the crowns of all who have been created by you. So also... Bless these, your servants, who have been crowned in the community of marriage with a special blessing. For your name has been blessed, and your kingdom has been glorified in the kingdom of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Bridegroom, be exalted like Abraham, blessed like Isaac, multiplied like Jacob, walking in peace and righteously doing God's commandments. And you, O bride, be exalted like Sarah, gladdened like Rebecca. Multiply like Rachel, being happy with your husband and keeping the precepts of the law. Do this and you will please God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord mercy. God or God, you went to Canaan Galilee and blessed the marriage there. Bless to these servants of yours now joined together by your providence in the communion of marriage. Bless their comings and goings. Give their life a great store of good things and receive the crowns in your kingdom, keeping them without spot or stain or reproach for ages of ages. Amen. Peace be to all. And to your spirit. By your hands to the Lord. 
may the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the all whole Trinity, one in being, the source of life, one Godhead and one kingship, bless you and give you long life, fine children, success in life and faith, a great store of the good things of this earth, and find you worthy of receiving as well the good things which have been promised. We ask this through the prayers of the Holy, Theot Holy Theotokos and those of all the saints. Except for the bride and groom, you can all sit down for a few moments. In the name of the Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Those two verses come from Psalm 118 from the Old Testament. And the fact that you're all here... I can assume that we're all rejoicing and being glad in this day when these two people have come here to receive this sacrament, this holy mystery of holy matrimony. And I hope that all of you can actually believe that the Lord did have something to do with this day. For those rare families like Daniel's that have more than one ordained cleric in their family, they get to hear a lot more preaching than most people would on a Sunday, just for a few minutes, whether they want to or not. But I can tell you right now that everything you heard in the service, everything I will say, and everything my brother will say afterwards, is truly from the wisdom of the church. But since every day we get so bombarded with so many things <coughs> that are contrary to what marriage really is about, you can't get enough of this wisdom of the church. In the Byzantine church, the holy mystery of holy matrimony, it's not just a formality that makes these two legally married. It is a sacrament that they have received. And sacraments in our church are the gift of the grace of God that he has given to us so that we can do something physical to become closer and closer to this invisible God. And in the Eastern Church, the couple receives the sacrament through the priest who stands here as the person that fills the place of Jesus Christ on earth. And we got to see that today when such a beautiful imagery of Daniel and Margaret, Meg, coming up the aisle together with the priest in the center, showing that they will have a Christ-centered marriage. Together, as they come up closer and closer to Christ, they get closer and closer to one another. And when they came up that aisle, it was their very first challenge of their marriage to start to realize that they were no longer single people, but they had been wed in such a special way. Since there are so many priests here, I have a little confession to make. Personally, I am surprised to see Meg here. Let me tell you why. When Meg first... When Meg first came into our life, she was being brought to church by Daniel. And we figured, with Meg not knowing the Byzantine church, she wasn't going to last one service. And she'd use her track ability and run out the door, never to be seen again. But she didn't. So we gave her a little more tests. We took her to church every Sunday. We took her to a very hot and long bishop's installation. We took her to Holy Days. We took her to Holy Week before Easter, which means you go to church every day and three times on Good Friday. But she still, she still kept coming around. I guess she's a little tougher than she looks. And during those months and years, she began to really appreciate the Byzantine faith and was welcomed in this very church. In 
into the Byzantine faith. And so I say once again, congratulations. My words today are in somewhat from personal experience, but again, I will say that they are from the wisdom of the church. And what do I mean by any of that? Well, first of all, the church gives us the example of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, as the bridegroom, is wed to his bride, the church, in a spousal relationship. And we know that Jesus did so much for the church. In the end, he gave himself up for her. St. Paul tells us that this spousal relationship is a mystery, as are so many other things that God brings us and God does. We can't understand everything that God does, but we accept it on faith, and we are privileged to take part of it through his grace. So what does the church say, after all, about the two reasons for getting married? They, find, they sound a little utilitarian, but I'm going to tell you what they are right now. The first one is that so these two people can come together in a complementary physical way and become co-creators of human life on earth, to bring children into the family, into this world. And the second reason is for the unending, unconditional self-sacrifice of one individual for the sake of the other to be able to shed off the old cloak of your selfish, centered, self-centered single life and to give more to the other person than you would give to yourself. And that's it. The two reasons for getting married. And so by now you're probably thinking, well, listen to this know-it-all deacon. He forgot to mention love. Well, I didn't forget, and I will talk about it. Now let me ask first for some of the older couples here, some of them have been married a long time. I want you to raise your hands right now if you love your spouse. Okay. <laughs> it was going to change the whole homily if no hands went up, believe me. <laughs> now think back to those early days so long ago when you were first dating and you were so excited to see one another and you got engaged and you got married. Try for a moment to compartmentalize that love just for a moment. Now, I want you to think about the love that you have for your spouse right now, these older couples. Raise your hand if you think that that love is the same or equal to the love you had when you were young. Okay. It's not really a right or wrong answer there, but if you got it right, you would have not raised your hand. Because you see, it's not fair to compare the love that we have now for one another to the love that Meg and Daniel have. This is not a put down on their love, it's the reality. You can't compare a love, say, of my wife and I. Oh no, our love has been able to stand the test of time, almost 33 years Love that's withstood maintaining a household of raising eight children, of financial concerns, of the loss of many loved ones. Oh no, our love has stood the test of time and only grown better and stronger by our commitment to one another. That is what love is. And this is my underlining that statement. Commitment is what it's all about. Love on its own was not what the thing that was going to propel us through all those years. Love on its own is not going to be the very foundation of your marriage. After all, a famous Protestant theologian once said, it is not your love that will sustain your marriage. It is your marriage that will sustain your love. See, the problem is too many of us see love as simply a feeling. And we can't be dictated in our life by simply our feelings. Of course, we do have a lot of feelings when it comes to marriage. But some of them would be better described as infatuation, or admiration, or passion, or even lust. The problem with thinking that love is just another feeling is that feelings are very fickle. They come and go. 
people love this and then they don't love this. It wasn't too long ago all of us Cleveland Browns fans loved Baker Mayfield, and now we don't. So people fall in love, and then they fall out of love and they get divorced. The love we need for a marriage is the verb form of it, to love. It is a choice you make to be committed to that other person, to care about that other person even more than you care about yourself. And a commitment like that requires a lot of effort. The problem is, too many of us, I'm sorry, I stated earlier that we have a lot of misinformation about the marriages in our life, and there's a lot there I could talk about. But I'm going to pick on one particular show on Netflix. It's called Married at First Sight, if anybody has seen that. It's an awful, horrible show that, to which my wife and I are completely addicted. Okay? <laughs> but it's a good thing because we finished the last season and we're done. But it's an amazing concept to see these couples. These single people come from all around, hundreds, thousands of them. They fill out, they fill out interviews, they're interviewed and they fill out surveys. And five couples each season are matched together by this marriage expert. And it truly is amazing to watch these couples because they don't know each other. They're not allowed to see each other. In fact, it's when the bride is coming up the aisle when the husband-to-be first sees his wife. Imagine that. And they get to, you see how they get to know each other and so on. But from the very beginning, they're quite doomed because they have no concept of that reason I talked to you about, the self-sacrifice for the sake of the other. These couples are completely into it for themselves and how the other person can satisfy them, meet her, his or her expectations, and make him happy or her happy. The other part is that they really don't quite get the whole being married thing. They're still very much single people trying to live this life. But you know, some of them, and one couple in particular, they kind of got it. They kind of understood that marriage was about the other person. And you could see them getting closer and closer to each other. And eventually, after about six weeks in real time, they told each other that they loved each other. Now imagine, these are two people that didn't even know each other, let alone love each other, before they got married. And to me, they have a pretty strong foundation because they're not letting just a simple feeling be the foundation of their marriage. Usually after a wedding service, I get questions asked, and this new book, which is not quite released yet, so it has a lot of very good information in here about the service itself. But one of the questions I get asked is, what's all with the crowns? What's up with those? Well, one thing you can notice if you happen to look at this crown, and if you put it up next to your ring, you'll notice that these rings and the crown have a perfect circle. And in the church, the perfect circle is emphasized as that of God in the perfect eternal being, the perfect eternal love that happens through God. And that's what's supposed to happen through us. But these crowns that they wore today show that Margaret and Daniel are now the king and queen of their own family, king and queen of their domestic church. But these are not the crowns that the king of England or the queen of England might wear. The church calls these the crowns of martyrdom. And you think, martyrdom? And the couple may be thinking to each other, to whom am I to be martyred? Hmm. All you have to do is look at one another, and you'll see it. Because we heard it in the epistle today, in Ephesians 5, which is the other thing that I get asked, and it's the people talking. Because in there, the epistle talks about husbands love your wives. As, I'm sorry, I need to go back. To be martyred for the other person. To put aside that self-centered singleness that you had all your life. Everything was directed in toward you. When you were a baby, everything was given to you. And when you got older and single, 
everything became what it was about me to be comfortable. Now you have to think about someone else. And so we see this in the epistle. But what happens is the people don't read the rest of the epistle or pay attention. Because it says here, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He gave himself up for her. So my son Daniel standing here should be thinking to himself, wait a minute, all she has to do is show some respect for me and I am supposed to be giving up my life for her. No pressure at all, not at all. The Meg needs to support you in this and it will take practice because up your whole life up until now for the most part is having everything directed inward. Now, if you think this self-sacrifice stuff for each other is hard, just wait till you have children. <laughs> I'm sorry for laughing. Really, I'm sorry for laughing. Children, of course, add a new twist to the challenges of marriage. Children are a blessing from God, and my wife and I, uh, Kate, were blessed eight times. You know, when I tell people I have eight children, they kind of back up like, ugh, like it's contagious or something, you know. But in this service, we heard the word children about a dozen times. It is the church's wish that you will be blessed with good children and even blessed even more to see your children's children. And for some people who are really blessed, like my mother, you get to see your children's children's children. And so I'm done talking to the couple. For the rest of us, Daniel and Meg are going to need our help. For today, it is no longer Dan Loya and Meg Cantley. They are a newly united couple that have come here and received the sacrament of holy matrimony, and they now call themselves Mr. and Mrs. Cantley. Mr. and Mrs. Loya. They must, from this day onward, focus on their primary relationship. They must do that first and foremost. You know, so many of us have come here to witness this reception of a sacrament, and we're going to have all kinds of fun soon over in the hall at the reception. But when Meg and Daniel wake up tomorrow morning, they're going to look at each other and say, Oh, my. It's just us. What did, what did Dad tell us yesterday that we were supposed to do? Oh, was I paying attention? Just the two of you. Daniel and Meg, before today, the relationships that we had with them must change. We all must take a back seat to their union. Anything else by us would be selfish on our part. Because... It's said in the epistle today, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and cling to his wife, and the two shall become one. So what the couple right now does not need from us is a bunch of suggestions, a bunch of unsolicited advice, treating them as if they're still 10 years old, which is a, a good thing parents do. What they need from us today and from now on is our love, our prayers, and our support. For this is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Wisdom. More honorable than the cherubim, and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who a virgin gave birth to God the Word, you truly the Thales or Ghost we magnify. Glory to you, O Christ God, our hope, glory to you. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. May Christ, our true God, 
who proved marriage honorable by his presence in the Cana of Galilee through the prayers of his most pure mother, of the holy and ever honored apostles, the holy, divinely crowned sovereigns and equals the apostles, Constantine and Helen, of the holy martyr Procopius, and through the prayers of all the saints, have mercy us and save us, for Christ is good and loves us all. As we conclude this wedding ceremony, I want to thank this couple for the privilege that I've had to celebrate this ceremony. I am the uncle of Daniel, the groom. I baptized him when he was a little baby. I also want to thank my brother priest, first and foremost, Father Midon, the pastor here, was also the spiritual father of the bride. As it was with him and through him, this parish, this wonderful parish, this wonderful priest, that she came into the Byzantine Catholic Church. And also, his son is here, also Father Midon. I believe that one of your babies was crying, right? Have you heard his <laughs> children? And Father Michael Heiduk, retired priest, but long time friend of our family. As you heard, this marriage was entered into the life of the church, the life of the Trinity, according to the mind of the church, and the church has given this couple two special gifts. This day that they were married, we celebrate the exaltation of the cross. Well, there was the wisdom of the cross, and that wisdom lived and understood, guarantees a happy marriage. It's the only way, as you heard from my brother, Deacon Greg. But also, something very special. We celebrate martyrs in our church who embrace the cross. And this day, there are three child martyrs named after the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And their mother, who modeled that faith for them, Sophia. They were martyred. On this day, this is the celebration of their feast. This is when this couple is married. And this church has in this, or in the wall there, the icon of that family, those three little girls and their mother, which is very, very unusual, very unusual. And so this indeed is a providential day for this wedding. And hopefully, after the many and for each and every one of the many anniversaries they will celebrate, they will remember the providential character of this day that they chose to be married. To the newly wedded, Daniel and Margaret, grant, O Lord, true and faithful love, a peaceful, happy, and godly life, and long-lived descendants, and grant them many years. Thank you.